right, so we have homework, and I can take questions. Any questions that you may have on that homework? Right. <laughs> then this was the RM file. That's not going to work. Yeah, the people at home can see my can see the window, but you guys can't. Yeah. All right, so we this is the R. This is the homework. Uh, any questions on it? Hopefully it was pretty easy. Right? Parametric confidence intervals. Have to use our T, use our standard error. This one doesn't have our standard error function, so you'll have to copy and paste it to get it in there. All right? Um, you'll have uh, bootstrapping, so you'll write your bootstrapped, and, and we have a script right now that can copy and, and paste it to get in there, all right, and then I'll actually give you a function that makes it a whole lot easier, but kind of going through the process and writing it yourself helps you understand what's going on, because you can now kind of picture that whole sampling with replacement to get these 95% intervals for these 95% of our values because that is what our hypotheses tests are doing. We, our bootstrap sample is basically like a null distribution. All right. I have a simple, maybe dumb question, but um, is there a function where you can do the plus minus when you do the write-up on here or do you just do plus <laughs> There is, there is, we had to ask for it. Um, okay. So what you could do is copy and play, paste, or this other thing is to use dollar sign backslash pm dollar sign, and that's going to give us our our plus or minus. Okay. Um, now, I, I can't guarantee it's going to work in Word. It, I think it, I, I don't know if it will or not. Okay. All right. And I say that because this came from, did plus or minus an R? Or markdown. It's a markdown document. All right. And they give some commonly used things. And I know that what I was doing is 
So the dollar signs just kind of set it off and say, you're going to do some sort of code. You're writing a math equation is what we're going to do. And then during the, the markup, the Pandoc stuff that happens, you'll see Pandoc, you know, code and function. It'll catch that and says, oh, that's a math expression. And this backslash PM is saying plus or minus. So I'm going to replace whatever was typed there with this plus or minus sign. You can do the same thing with dollar sign slash alpha or any other Greek symbol. Um, so on our exam, I believe, I had micrometers, you know, mu and then m on it. And on mine, it wouldn't render properly when I made the PDF. So I had to use this notation. Yours, I think yours did. I didn't notice it, like missing the mu on it. But when I made my PDF, it didn't work. So I could do mu and pops up as it should. Pretty, pretty interesting. You got the degree sign that's in here. Uh, some other kind of cool stuff. But yeah, I'll tell you how you could do it if you wanted it. Or you can just do generic way and just do plus minus. Plus minus. And that could work too. I know, I know what you're saying. All right. So homework, uh, if you run into questions, please, please email. Uh, this is just to kind of drive home more practice for you. All right? This is, that's all this is to kind of get you practice doing parametric bootstrapping or parametric confidence intervals, doing uh, your bootstrap confidence intervals, all of that, because you'll see that on the exam. You will see that on the exam. All right. So. to our hypothesis test. So one sample test. Here's Z-score review. So that's what we talked about. We did our, our Z-test. All right, you'll see it as a z-score test. I, I normally write it as a z-test. Don't worry about z-scores. Just say z-test or z-score test. Either one will work. All right. So we use it to compare a single value or a sample mean to a population mean. And in this case, we need to know our population standard deviation. All right. We need that when we use that population standard deviation and divide it by the square root of our sample size that we're making our comparison with, that's going to calculate our standard error. And again, we use our standard error when we do statistical tests. When we do that transformation, when we do the x bar minus mu over the standard error using our population standard deviation, that gets us into z, which is a normal 0, 1 distribution. All right? So, our normal table is used to calculate our p-value. Right. Our null hypothesis in this case is that our sample mean is equal to that hypothesized mean or that hypothesized value. All right. And then the p-value is the area under the curve that is as extreme or more extreme. So it could be to the right of our line. It could be to the left of our line. It could be both tails if we have a two-tail test. All right. So in R, we use P norm. All right. Just remember, and you give your population mean, mean equals whatever is given in the problem. All right. The standard deviation is the standard deviation what it, that's given in the problem divided by the square root of our sample size All right. to get our standard error. If it's a two-tailed test, multiply it by two. If it's a one-tailed test, just leave it as is. And as I said, when we drew our diagram up there, sometimes it's easier to draw that diagram to know if you need to have lower dot tail equals t or lower dot tail equals f. And then with the z-test, when you report it, you report your uh, z-test that you, that, you, that you ran, p-value, and the conclusion. 
This does not have a test statistic. It does not have degrees of freedom. All right. T-test. Very similar. All right. The difference is this. The S. What does S mean? What is it? Standard deviation of a sample. All right. So what we are doing is we don't know the population standard deviation. So what we're going to do is approximate it using our sample standard deviation, the sample that we actually collected. All right. And to make that approximation, we're going to take our sample standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size. So we're, we're calculating standard error. When we do that, when we do this transformation, we're no longer in the Z. We're not no, normal 0, 1 anymore. All right. Instead, we're going to follow a t-distribution. Right. This is the reason why we use the t-distribution when we did our confidence intervals. Right. We are using our sample standard deviation to approximate a population level standard deviation. And when we calculate that standard error using that sample, then we follow a t-distribution. That's why we use it. All right. So when do we use the t? Well, we're going to use it to answer the same types of questions as we do with, with the z-test. So is our sample mean equal to some population mean? All right. Or is our sample mean equal to some value? All right. But in this case, we only have the sample standard deviation. Now, this test makes some assumptions. It assumes that our data are random and independent. All right. And we'll come back, we'll come back to that point. It also assumes that our sample is normally distributed. All right? And again, we'll come back to it. What we'll do first is kind of introduce this test under the assumption that everything is, is kosher, that we are random and independent and we are normally distributed. If these are the case, then this transformation will follow a t distribution where our degrees of freedom is equal to the sample size minus 1. All right? So we do this transformation, and then instead of it following a normal distribution, it'll follow a t-distribution. And we're going to do the same sort of thing. Our p-value will be equal to the probability that we get that we can get a t-value that is greater than or equal to our t-observed value. I should probably say the absolute value first. All right. So it's going to come back to this probability that we could get a value that is equal or exceeds our actual t observed if our means are actually equal. All right. So when we look at that p value, when we look at that p value, what we're doing is still also calculating the area underneath our tails. And we only do, we do one area if it's a one-tail one test. We do both sides if it's a two-tail test. And just like our normal, on a t-distribution, we're centered at zero. And our t-distributions are symmetric. So if we have a two-tail test, we can calculate that one area and then multiply it by two to get the corresponding other area, or to get the other area, the negative side of it. All right? So... If we did it by hand, we would use our t-tables. A t-table would come up with a critical value that basically is our cutoff. So this could be our t-crit. All right, and then we look to see where does our t-observed fall? Is it in our rejection region? Or is it in our acceptance region? So if it's in our acceptance region, we fail to reject our null hypothesis. And our p-value then would be greater than 0.05. If we fall in our rejection region, then we're going to reject that null hypothesis and conclude that our sample mean is not equal to that whatever given value we're, we're testing against. All right? And we know that our p-value then will be less than or equal to 0.05. That T critical marks a spot where we have 5% in our tails. It's 
5% in both tails for a two-tail test, or 5% in only one tail for a one-tail test. All right, so let's get to an example. So here's an example. Average size of species, species A is 89.44. All right, sample of 10 individuals, we calculate a mean size of 92.99, standard deviation of 5.11. Is your sample similar to species A? So you have an unknown, all right? Let's say you're looking at parasitic worms. You found some worms, found 10 of them, you measure them. You think you know what species it is. You look up that species and it says, well, the average length is 89.44 millimeters. Pretty darn big for a worm, all right? Right. So, is our sample part of this population? Well, our choice is going to be a Z test or a T test. That's kind of what, what our choice is. Why do I say that's our choice? It's one sample. We have one variable, that's it, and that variable is a continuous variable. So our choice is going to be a Z test or a T test. We then look at the problem. Do we have a sample standard deviation or a population level standard deviation? The sample standard deviation. We don't know what the standard deviation is of species A, so what we'll do is approximate it. So what we're going to try to do is figure out how likely is it that we could get a value of 92.99 or more extreme if we actually have a mean of 89.44. So for this we're saying probability that x is going to be greater than 92.99 and then we'll multiply it by 2 to get that other tail. All right, so when we do our transformation, just like we, we would have worked through if we were doing it by hand, this doesn't give us a Z anymore. This actually gives us a T. So now we're going to say, well, what's the probability that we can get a T that's going to be greater than or equal to 2.197, which is our actual observed value? And with that T value, we're going to multiply that by 2. So if we did it by hand... How would we do it? Coding. <laughs> How would we do it? Okay, how many degrees of freedom do we have? Nine. How do you know? N minus one. It is N minus one. How do I rotate? Okay, so this was a t-table that was posted. So our degrees of freedom, ridiculous. Maybe that? No. Let me find, where's the rotate on here? Rotate, rotate clockwise, there. All right, so in the problem we said, it was 10 samples. So what we do to get our con to get our degrees of freedom is just take 10 minus 1. All right? So on this t table, this v or nu represents our degrees of freedom. So we go down to 10. And then what we need to know is figure out what is our cutoff value. Our cutoff value is going to correspond to the alpha level that we set for our test. All right, so what's our alpha level that we set for our test? 0.05, all right? Is this one tail or two tail? It's going to be a two tail test because we asked, is this part of species A? We didn't set a direction. So our null hypothesis is that our means are equal. Our alternate is that the means are not equal. For this table, we are getting critical values. A 0.05 means 5% in both of these tails. So this is a table where we would use 5%, 0.05 column, to represent our 5% cutoff. All right? So what we would have done is taken our 10 degrees of freedom, read across the road to get to this column, 2.228. So that is our critical value. Yeah, 
right, sorry. Is it nine? It yeah. is. Sample size of 10? Yeah. Right? All right, so yeah, 10 minus one is nine, so 2.262. 2.262, that's our critical value. Our observed is what we calculated. Our observed is 2.1. 197. So now we look at our comparison. All right? We look at our comparison. Is this value greater than this 2.262? No. All right? We're less than that. So if we set our t critical is 2.262, our actual value is going to fall someplace right around there, 2.197. We're in our acceptance region. We failed to reject the null hypothesis, so it's entirely possible that we could get a mean of whatever we got, 92.99, if the real mean was actually 89.44. So we would go back and conclude then that, yeah, our sample of specimens could do it appear to be a species A. All right, so my write-up included my conclusion. It appears to be species A. This case, I went back and referenced our biological question to do our conclusion. I report my t-test, that's what we ran. I give our t, 2.197, degrees of freedom, and p-value. Now, we, how did we get a p-value? How did I get 0.06? Well, this kind of goes back to our table on how we can approximate a p-value. So what I would do is read across this row and say, okay, well, where does, my, where does our t-observed fall? We know it's, not, it's less than 2.262. And it's greater than 1.833. So we're going to fall someplace between here, these two values. And when we use our table, all that we can then say is that our p-value is going to be between 0.05 and 0.1. That's all that we can say. Now, I got the 0.06 because I used R. Now, how did I do it in R? Well, let's get R Studio on here. All right, so get down here and get to our t-test. All right. So our example problem had a mean, right? Had a mean standard deviation associated with it. And we calculated a t-observed of 1.197. All right. I'm sorry, 2.197. 2.197. All right. So, how do we get the area under the curve of that? Well, it's a two tailed test, right? So, I'm going to do two times a value. What function did we use for the normal curve to get that area under the curve? did that for the z-test. What function did we use? P norm. All right. And it, we did that because the z follows a normal distribution. If this t observed follows a t distribution, what function do you think we're going to use? Pt. Pt. All right. We're going to do 2.197. That's our observed. Our degrees of freedom is 9. So PT needs a degrees of freedom. And we have the option of a lower dot tail. Now for us, our P value is as extreme or more extreme. And since we have the positive, 2.197, we're going to use lower dot tail equals false to get that upper tail and then multiply it by 2. So I've got lower dot tail equals false. For the PT function, I run it and I get this p-value, 0 0.0556, which rounds to 0 0.06. Right? Follow our rounding rules. It's greater than 0 0.05. We only go to two decimal places. This rounds to 0 
this is all great when we work it out by hand, but I kind of skipped some steps. All right? So in our example problem, I actually gave you a population mean. So mu is equal to 80. I'm going to type this up here so I can see it. We said it was 89.44. And then we said our x bar of our sample was 92.99. Standard deviation of our sample was 5.11. And our sample size was 10. All right? So here's our important information. When we did the z test, we could just use p norm and we can give it the mean and standard deviation. And, and again, correct the standard deviation so it's a standard error, all right? But R took care of the rest. With a t-test by hand, we can't do that. We actually have to calculate t ourselves. So first thing we have to do is calculate t observed. All right? So our t observed is our x bar oops, minus our mu divided by our s over the square root of n. All right? That's kind of what we're going to be, we're going to have to do. So what I will do is we have our x bar. That's 92.99. I'm going to subtract 89.44. And I'm going to divide by 5.11 over the square root of our sample size. And that gives me 2.197. Now I could save that as t-obs if I wanted to. All right. Save as my t-observed. And then, now, so using our, we're going to calculate our p value using the pt function. That function is pt, where we use our t observed, degrees of freedom is n minus 1, and lower dot tail is either going to be T or F. In this case, I'm going to use F. All right. Why is that? So if T observed is greater than zero, use lower dot tail equals F. We're going to do our upper tail. If T observed is less than zero, so if we calculate a negative value, We're going to use lower dot tail equals t. So t distribution symmetric. If our t observed is positive, we'll use our upper tail. If t observed is negative, we'll use our lower tail. In this case, t observed is positive. So I'll use lower dot tail equals f. I'll replace 2.197 with t observed. Run that, run that, and I get my answer. So in a problem like this where I just give you the values, t-test is a little bit more involved because we have to first calculate our t-observed, and then we have to pass it to the pt function to get our p-value. Question. Let's move on. So here's our, here's our stuff here. Again, it's everything that I put in that R markdown. All right, gave you your function. All right, I wrote it as T observed, just to kind of emphasize that this is something that we calculated. We observed that value. All right, degrees of freedom is n minus 1. All right, lower dot tail equals T and F. Again, just for negative values, you're going to use lower dot tail equals t. For positive values, lower dot tail equals f. 
And then the demonstration that, yeah, when we used our data from that example problem, we get the exact same p-value. It's greater than 0.05, so we go to two decimal places. That's our rounding. All right, here's some practice. All right, you don't, you don't need to use the table, although if you want to, you could. All right, the table doesn't really give us good p-values, you could say. It'll give you a range of p-values, where our p-value is going to be between. All right, but we're going to use R to do these three questions, or these two questions. Note, again, that we don't have our population level standard deviation. These are all standard deviations from a sample. We use that sample to estimate our population level standard deviation, which is our standard error. So for a population, right, population standard deviation, we do a, a z-test, but for a sample, we use our t-test. So these are two problems. Do your, write down the hypotheses null and alternate hypotheses for both of these. Run your test to obtain a p-value and then have a write-up including all the items that we need to include for this t-test. And I'll give you some time. I'm going to check it right before we end class.
That's your S squared. What's S squared? It's our variance. It's our sample variance. S squared is a sample variance, and the square root of our variance is the standard deviation. So our English letters, English letters that represent samples, our Greek letters represent populations. Um, that's in second presentation, maybe. Samples and populations. You'll see it again. Fine. T. So yeah, uh, an SQRT is, is a square root function. So you don't have to worry about that. Alright, so I think what we'll do since you're still working on this, uh, I think we'll stop here. Finish this off at home, um, and then on Friday, what we'll do is we'll sh we'll go through this. And please don't look ahead on the PowerPoint because it kind of gives you the code. But try to work through it because we also have a homework assignment. All right. And what we'll do is we'll kind of work through this first, and then the homework assignment I'll I'll make sure it gets released so you can look at it. And what we'll do on Monday, uh, we'll talk about it, and either that Monday at the start of class or at the start of lab will answer like part A of each of those questions, which is, are we doing the Z test or the T test? That way everyone's on the same page. And then uh, in lab that afternoon, you can use that time to, to finish off the homework. Because uh, that next homework is basically your T test. Yes. All right? So work through it, have an answer. We'll, we'll do these answers on Friday.